Okay, now that I'm on a negative note, let's get back to I'm sorry. I'm the one who brought it up. It's my fault. He got home Friday morning from his trip. Mom said he was sick all night. He takes a, he's discovered that if he takes a, like a veteran, a new stomach, it plays havoc with his blood sugar. And his blood sugar was like 197. So, I did too. You can keep talking. <laughs> we got 30 seconds yet or so. Good morning. morning. We're glad you're here to worship with us today. Please note on the back of your bulletin the schedule for the week. Participate in what is available to you. I want to especially draw your attention to two things. Uh, the 9.30 a.m. Wednesday morning prayer group has resumed its Bible study part of their meeting, and it's not too late to join them. They're doing a study on the book of Job. Uh, and you can talk to Ann Martin or Jan Martin uh, for information about that. Ann isn't here today. Um, I will be on vacation through next Monday, but I'll be available for emergencies. Um, and then next Sunday, Ann Martin and Donna Almond have coordinated a service of music ministry in which we'll have many of your favorite hymns, so you won't want to miss that and invite others you know who like uh, that music as well, and you'll have a great time worshiping God through music next week. Today's participants are Jim Cleveland on the tech booth, Donna Allman, Kathy Novak, and the praise band are on the instruments. Our lay reader is Terry Priest, and Jeff and Linda gordon are our ushers today. And of course, all of you who are in the room or watching online and singing, listening, praying, and doing all that is involved in putting ourselves before God in thankful worship for all he's done for us. So thank you for being a part of that today. Our money verse today is adapted from Deuteronomy 16, 15 through 17. The Lord your God blesses you with success in all your work. It is a time of great joy for all. Appear before the Lord your God with a gift for him. All must give as they are able according to the blessings given to them by the Lord our God. Let's collect the offering.
Lord, receive these offerings as signs that we are giving ourselves to your mission and not worrying about the things that we cannot do. Bless these gifts and us so that they and we will bring love and hope in Jesus' name. Now ignite our spirits to revel in your presence and inspire our souls to rest in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing for a creedal type song as the praise band leads us. Because we believe that we have come here to worship and humbly acknowledge that God is our God, let's sing together, Here I Am to Worship. Darkness, open my eyes, let me see. 
him because of who he is and all that he has done for us, including the sending of his Holy Spirit on those who believe in him. So join me on the yellow font while Terry leads us in the white. Anyone who believes in Jesus may come and drink of the living water he gives, and they will never be thirsty again. For it becomes within us a perpetual, fresh, bubbling spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Rivers of living water will burst out from within your hearts, from your innermost being. Living water means the Holy Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in Jesus. Therefore, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives and do not gratify what your sinful nature craves. We have crucified the passions and desires of our sinful nature to his cross. Since the Spirit is our source of life, let us keep living in the Spirit by keeping in step with him and following his leading as he directs every aspect of our lives. 
the fruit of the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love. Jesus said, Out of the virtue stored in their hearts, good and upright people will produce good fruit. Likewise, out of the evil hidden in their hearts, evil ones will produce what is evil. For the overflow of what has been stored in your heart will be seen by your fruit and will be heard in your words. So let's illustrate it this way. Our lives are a sponge. (laughs) Whatever our lives are saturated with is what comes out of us. Sometimes it just trickles. And when we're in pressure and under stress, a little more, and when we're under a lot of pressure, a lot comes out, right? Sure. (laughs) Now what we would normally like to see come out of us is the living water of the Holy Spirit, right? Now, naturally, a sponge picks up more than just what it's trying to saturate itself with. Sometimes, just like when I was pouring this water yesterday out of the sink in the kitchen, a big bug came right into the bowl. (laughs) I don't know where it came from. I think it was in the faucet. So sometimes we pick up things, and sometimes those happen to get out of us as well. But normally, under most circumstances, what we want to see is the Holy Spirit's virtues coming out of us, because that's what we want to be saturated with. Or to put it in the context of our reading And Jesus' fruit metaphor, a plant soaks up water and nutrients from the soil and soaks up the sun. And if the plant is not overly attacked by bugs and germs, if it has been soaking up healthy things, it energizes the birth and growth of a good fruit. All this is a natural process and the result of input to output, just like in a computer. Garbage in, garbage out, good stuff in, good stuff out. If it takes in all the good stuff by its very nature, good fruit can't help but burst forth from the plant. It's important to remember that this process is natural from the inside out. We can't take a nice piece of fruit and tack it onto a tree and say, that's a good tree, right? Right. Right. Oh, okay. (laughs) Got to make sure you're still with me. It's important to remember that because as we go through this series talking about the fruit of the series, when we talk about the practical applications and implications, it may sound like it's all up to us to work up this good fruit by ourselves. But we can't do that. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And our job is to stay connected with the Spirit and allow Him to work in us and through us and out of us. So it's connecting with Him that is critical. It's what I call releasing the power of the Spirit within us. That's why the series is called Releasing the Spirit. And it is the natural result of being connected with Him that these things will flow out of us. Or to put it simply, the underlying principle is not what we must somehow work this behavior into our life, but rather how we allow the Spirit to flow in through and out of our life. For it is God who remembers us and wrestles in our hearts for us, and we discover that his love and grace is all that we need. So let's sing that song together. Your grace is enough. Oh, 
Since his grace and love and spirit is all we need, let's prepare our hearts for prayer by welcoming his presence among us. Become more aware of 
from your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Lord, today we come with gratitude. We thank you for your provision and care. We do not take for granted the gift of home and food. We are so grateful for the love of family and community. We're thankful for this beautiful place to gather in your name. For here we are challenged, encouraged, and reminded of who you are and what you have done. We are thankful for the work you are doing in our hearts and lives as individuals and as a group. Continue your transforming work so that we who have been loved will love. With whom you have been patient, we will show patience. And to we who have been shown kindness, will show kindness to others. That reminds us to think of those requests that have been made in recent days for Jan Martin's son, Brian, and especially his wife and family as they fight some COVID around them. For Kathy Novak's friend, Cindy Perkins, seeking professional care for her ailing parents. For a person named Dwayne, who's seeking prayers for safe travel, as well as some emotional and financial struggles. And a praise from Janice Wright for Bruce's CT scan showed he is in remission. We're so thankful for that. And then we pray for Jerry Weaver's mother-in-law, Gloria Stone, who's in ICU with multiple health issues and for whom we now dedicate this quilt. Lord, with humility, we come to your altar, lifting Gloria Stone before you and offering this quilt as a symbol of the prayers of this congregation. We know that you're always present in our lives and that your love transcends all tragedy, illness, and pain, but we also know that sometimes a physical reminder can help bring hope, healing, and peace to someone who is hurting. This quilt was pieced together with loving hands, not even yet knowing who the recipient would, would be, but you and your loving wisdom have already written her name in your heart. We don't always know what the future holds, but we do trust that you hold each life in your hands, and we know that we are never alone. And we pray this quilt will be a reminder of your warm, comforting presence. Wrap your arms around Gloria. Surround her with your love. Let her feel the caring of so many who hold her up in prayer. Bring her a hope and peace that only you can give. We ask your blessing on this quilt and on Gloria in the name of Jesus. Now help us hear your word anew, that the risen Christ may bring life and hope through your Holy Spirit, that we may better be empowered to live as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand before the reading and sermon and stretch a little bit and we'll sing, Because He Lives, Amen. Because Jesus lives, we, let, we have life full and free, a life that can conquer sin, a life that moves us into a certain future because we are held in his hands, a life, as we read earlier, that is lived in God's spirit. Ours is a life that, when, that is ever-growing and producing the fruit, the virtues, the character traits, of the Holy Spirit, general attitudes of love, joy, and peace, Relation, relational actions of patience, kindness, and goodness, and the eternal disciplines of faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Of course, all these qualities overlap and intersect. The last in the list, self-control, while a trait in itself is often considered the most important, making all the others possible. The first in our list, love. 
while a trait in itself is an overarching trait that filters through all the others. Our reading concluded with the first in the list, and that is what we will be looking at today. In one of Jesus' sermons, he illustrates for us what, is, what, his, what this kind of love looked like in the most challenging of circumstances. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies and do something wonderful for them in return for their hatred. When someone curses you, bless that person in return. When others mistreat and harass you, accept it as your mission to pray for them. To those who despise you, continue to serve them and minister to them. If someone takes away your coat, give him as a gift your shirt as well. When someone comes to beg from you, give to that person what you have. When things are wrongly taken from you, do not demand they be given back. The way you want others to treat you is how you should treat everyone else. Are you really showing true love by loving only those who love you? Even those who don't know God will do that. Are you really showing compassion when you do good deeds only to those who do good deeds to you? Even those who don't know God will do that. If you lend money only to those you know will repay you, what credit is that to your character? Even those who don't know God do that. Rather, love your enemies and continue to treat them well. When you lend money, don't despair if you are never paid back, for it is not lost. You will receive a rich reward, and you will be known as two true children of the Most High God, having his same nature. Be like your Father, who is famous for his kindness, to heal even the thankless and cruel. Overflow with mercy and compassion for others, just as your heavenly Father overflows with mercy and compassion for all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I forgot to put this out earlier, so I'll do it now. When we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, we know there are many types which are distributed to each person as the Spirit sees fit to equip each one of us, perhaps differently, and as we practice them, to be especially effective in the mission God has planned for each of us to do for him. But when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, it is singular in tense. A description of a variety of character traits that flow out of us as we learn to keep in step with, to cooperate with, to be obedient to the Spirit. In other words, the list of the fruit of the Spirit is not a list of individual traits from which we get to pick and choose. Or think we have some of these but not others, and that's okay. It's like a bunch of tomatoes. Each have traits that may vary. Some are redder, some are greener, some are meatier, some are juicier, some are bigger, some are smaller. The traits vary, but in the end, they all have the characteristics of a tomato. In the same way, while we may be naturally better at some aspects than others, we should possess all of these characteristics in ever-increasing measure as we grow in Christ, as we're guided by His Spirit. And we already mentioned the first overarching quality of the Spirit, and therefore eventually of all of us, is love. Love is a word that's used to describe anything from lunch to cars to the other extreme of the most extreme commitments of our life causes people and God himself. The stress in biblical love is not so much on feelings, or certainly includes those, but is primarily a choice of attitude, of will, 
of our actions. It is a section of Jesus, in the section of Jesus' sermon we heard Terry read, Jesus gives some very practical steps in releasing the Spirit's love in the most difficult context, in loving enemies. And it was not abstract, theoretical idealism on his part. He not only told us that in a sermon, he went and showed it to us by weeping over those who rejected him and praying for the forgiveness of those who were hanging him on a cross. I'm hardly an expert on these things, much less accomplished these things in any great way, just a fellow journeyer like the rest of us. My experience is that these approaches, while practiced consistently, when practiced consistently, not only have potential to work with enemies, but also with our friends and family, too. (laughs) Hopefully they aren't the same. (laughs) (laughs) And not only that, it works wonders within our own attitudes about ourselves, for we are not reactive to what other circumstances and people do to us, but we can be who we are in spite of that. And that makes us feel better about ourselves, I think. So the first key to master our, to accomplishing this love released in our life is to master our thought life about people that we love or struggle to love. To focus not on our opinion of what is wrong with a person or persons, but on what is right about them. Our Bible text called this, bless others, even when they curse you. Jim Smith went to church on Sunday morning. He heard the organist miss a note during the prelude and he winced. He saw a teenager talking when everybody was supposed to be bowed in prayer. He felt the usher was watching to see if, how much he put in the offering or if, if he wasn't taking something out of the offering even. And that made him boil. He caught the preacher making a slip of the tongue five times. I think it's pretty good actually. Five <laughs> times during the sermon. And he slipped out through the side door during the closing hymn and he muttered to himself, I'm never coming back to that place. What a terrible bunch of clods and hypocrites and amateurs. (laughs) Ron Jones went to went to church one Sunday morning. He heard an organist play an arrangement of a mighty fortress is our God and he was thrilled at the majesty of who he had served. He heard a young girl take a moment in the service to speak her simple moving message of the difference that faith made in her life. He was glad to see that this church was sharing a special offering for hungry children. He especially appreciated the sermon that Sunday as it answered a question that had bothered him for a long time. And he thought as he walked out the doors of that church, how can a person come here and not feel the presence of God? Jim Smith and Ron Jones attended the same service the same day, and they both found what they were looking for. And the same is true when we think about the people we love or struggle to love. We not, on, we, we not only look for the good in others, but sincerely wish well-being and good and wholeness on them. That's a tall order in the context of enemies, with people whom we disagree or who rub us the wrong way, but we may, but the Spirit's flow, begin to feel more and more appreciative if we can focus on good things. And that's often hard, and that's why Jesus follows that right up by suggesting we bathe that positive focus in prayer. Someone once said, I don't want you to pray for me because I know what you're going to pray for, that I'll change, and I don't want to change. I like who I am, who I am. And in this particular text, change of the other is not the point that Jesus is trying to make. His intent is not for us to pray against, make them see it my way, Lord, or to pray about, kind of like a vertical gossip session, but to pray for them. It isn't about changing their behavior, but adjusting our attitude to be like the one who died for us while we were yet sinners and enemies of God. And as our mind's attitudes towards others are adjusted by our thought life, blessing them, and our heart's attitudes are adjusted by our prayer life for them, then restraint is called for as we interact with others. Do not desire revenge. Turn the other cheek. Or as today's paraphrase puts it, continue to serve and minister to those who despise you. A woman was out shopping one day and decided to take a break and stop 
for a cup of, cup of coffee. She bought a, I see I'm counting, that's, that's two slips. <laughs> Still ahead of the game. She bought a bag of cookies and put them in her purse and then she went into the line and entered in the coffee shop and got her coffee and all the tables were filled but as the custom of that particular coffee shop you just sat with other people you know and ignored them or whatever but they, you could sit anywhere and so she sat at an occupied table sitting across from a man who sat reading a newspaper she opened up her purse took out her book and began to read and after a while she looked up and reached for a cookie and only to see the man across from her also taking a cookie she glared at him <laughs> she smiled at her she resumed her reading. Moments later, she reached for another cookie, and the man also took one, and she was furious. But she said nothing and went back to reading. A few minutes later, she looked up and was staring at the one remaining cookie. <laughs> the man saw it, took the cookie, broke it in half, and offered her a piece. <laughs> then he politely excused himself and left the coffee shop, and she was really steaming. Her whole midday break had been ruined. She stuffed half that, cook, that last half of the cookie in her mouth and she angrily opened her purse to jam her book in and there was her open, unopened bag of cookies. <laughs> so much of life that makes us mad and want revenge falls along the lines of simple misunderstandings. Not always on the part of the enemy. Sometimes we're the ones who don't understand. We are positive we understand and that they understand exactly how they did us wrong, but many times they don't even know that we've been offended or hurt by what they've done. The lady was fortunate in this case to restrain, to hold her anger lest she become really embarrassed. If it's a big enough issue, of course, we need to communicate graciously and ensure that there is a clear understanding on both sides rather than assuming that they know what I think I know and vice versa. This woman would have done well to take the attitude of the man in her situation following Jesus' next bit of practical advice in our treatment of enemies to be a giver without expecting in return. There's a cynical version of that. If you expect nothing, you won't be disappointed. I think Jesus is trying to take us a step beyond that, or many steps beyond that. He's calling for an attitude that is more along the lines of, we give because we are generous givers. It doesn't have to do with who we're giving to or from. It's who we are. Because God was generous to us. It's not because we have an ulterior motive of purchasing a favor or a friendship or something else in return from the recipient. Everyone does that, and Jesus wants us to go to the next step. A man named Paul received a new automobile from his brother as a pre-Christmas present. Oh, wouldn't that be nice, huh? When he came out of his office one day, he saw a small poor boy walking around the shiny new car admiring it. As he drew close, the boy asked, Is that your car, mister? Yes, my brother gave it to me for Christmas. Wow, you mean it didn't cost you anything? Boy, I wish. And he trailed off, and Paul anticipated the end of the sentence that he had a brother like that. But then the boy started the sentence again and finished, I wish I could be a brother like that. Paul was shocked and impulsively just blurted out, You want to ride? And so he said he'd love that. And so they rode for a while, and the boy said, Mister, would you mind if you drove around in front of my house and Paul smiled to himself thinking that he wanted to show off his fancy ride to all of his family and friends and neighbors and he stopped where the boy had guided him to and the boy asked him to wait and he hopped out of the car and he ran up the steps of his house and a minute later returned carrying his small polio crippled brother and Paul could hear him saying there she is buddy just like I told you upstairs his brother gave it to him for Christmas and it didn't cost him anything and someday I'm going to give you one just like it. And then you can see for yourself all the pretty things in the Christmas windows that I've been trying to tell you about. Paul got out and helped them both into the front seat and they began a memorial, memorable holiday ride. And Paul understood a little better what Jesus meant when he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. The final key in this text 
To true biblical loving is to take positive action, to do good. Jesus surrounds these practical suggestions I'm talking about by starting out, by taking action. He says, as the NIV phrase it, do good to those who hate you. And then near the end of this section of his sermon, he concludes by saying, love your enemies, do good to them. So in the middle of this good, good sandwich, (laughs) he gives us what we now call the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Or as our readings paraphrase put it, the way you want others to treat you is how you should treat everyone else. So you start with good, you end with good, and you do that good, it's all through everything. In Jesus' world, several philosophies had already promoted the idea of not doing to others what you don't want them to do to you. In other words, I don't want you to beat me up, so I won't beat you up. But Jesus goes beyond the avoidance of treating others badly because we don't want to be treated badly. He expands it to the expectation that we want to be treated well, so we treat others well. We initiate positive action. We go out of our way to treat them well because that's what we'd want other people to do for us. Sometimes it's easier to, I've talked to you about this before, but I'll say it again. Sometimes it's easier to act our way into feeling than it is to try to feel our way into action. Try the as-if game. Well, exercise is a better word than game. If someone drives you batty, act toward them as if they didn't. (laughs) That laughter is too much. (laughs) All right. At least you're listening. (laughs) Treat your enemy as if they were your friend. Go out of your way to find and express what you find good about them. Be kind to them. Do what makes them happy. Be kind and considerate and generous. Do it so well that you make them believe you really like them. And guess what? Eventually you might. You know what Wesley advised his novice preachers as he was starting this ministry of Methodism, which he didn't want to do, but it ended up that way. He told them, if you don't believe it, preach it until you do. Convince yourself. Work on it. Practice it until it comes true. Dr. George Crane was approached by a woman who was bitter and vengeful toward her spouse and wanted to hurt him really badly before she left him. He encouraged her to try and act as if she loved him. And she thought, if I did that, he'd draw him right in really close, and then when I left him, he'd really be hurt. Mm. So for two months, she did the as-if actions, making him think everything was fine and good, and enthusiastically showed love and kindness and listening and giving and reinforcing and sharing and did everything in her power to make him happy. And after two months, she discovered she really did love him. (laughs) And the relationship was saved. Her actions changed her feelings. Motion resulted in emotion. The ability to love is established not so much by fervent promise or by feelings as it is by repeated gracious deeds. Obviously, that doesn't work all the time. Not in every relationship. It's not a magical formula. I do A and B has to happen. I do this and they have to respond that way. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes we'll fail to make a friend no matter what we do. But Jesus does not hold us accountable for the recipient's acceptance or reciprocity of our love. We have no control over what they're going to do. He doesn't expect us to control that. He does not hold us accountable for being, he does hold us accountable for being loving people regardless of how people love us or don't love us. Why would we want someone else's lack of love make us be something we don't want to be? Unloving, angry, bitter victims of their unlovingness to us. Why would we want to be unloving because of that? The ability to be loving, regardless of response, is empowered by Christ's Spirit that is within us. Squish that sponge. Let the Spirit come out instead of what we sometimes are tempted to feel and do. Praise band, you can come back now. I know it's difficult. I know I fall short of this mark way too often. I suspect I'm not the only one in the room. It'd be easier to lower the standards It'd be easier to make excuses and rationalizations of why this person or that circumstance should be exceptions to the rule. It's easy to play the yeah, but game. You know that one? Okay. Yeah, that's true. But in this case, 
Yeah, but I would prefer not to follow that. Yeah, but in this different, this is different because, and we continue to, but we just yab it, yab it, yab it, yab it, do kind of thing, you know, and we feel good about it. No, we need to continue to cooperate with the Holy Spirit within and grow, for ultimately, if love persists, it will defeat evil one way or another. I have to keep shooting for the mark of the cross that Jesus has set for us. As the saying go, he who shoots for the midday sun may never reach the mark, but he'll certainly shoot higher than the one who shoots for a bush. Right? Jesus concludes with a promise that as we love people, we struggle to love. As we do good to them, as we are generous with them, then our reward will be great. Not from them, necessarily, but because we will be children of, take on the characteristics of the Most High God. Because that is how he is, merciful to the ungrateful and wicked, the thankless and the cruel. No matter what they did to him. And he wants us to do that no matter what people do to us. Because God will always be filled with, and expects us to be always filled with, compassion and faithfulness and love. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes it's a struggle to be grateful and good even to our friends and family, much less enemies. We open our hearts and lives to you. Awaken us to your spirit. Help us to let go of that which hinders our love for you and for one another. Dissolve what makes us grasp for things rather than hold on to people. Ease us into your deep promise of community. Allow us to dwell in your healing forgiveness. Teach us to do for others what you have done for us. For in you are, you are strong and you strengthen us to what you want us to do. For you are good and your love and faithfulness endures forever. Amen. Let's stand please and we'll sing our closing song forever.
Now go blessed and renewed by the Holy Spirit. Go with strength and courage to bear the fruit of loving others so that our lives will help transform and renew his earth. Amen. Amen. Amen.